So now I want to solve the discrete time Vazicek model in a couple of other ways. Uh, these ways are a little more clever. You do a little more thinking ahead of time. You save algebra later. And that paves the way to being able to solve more complicated term structure models. So one way to go about it, the extreme brute force uh, method, is to solve the discount factor forward and integrate. This is one of the ways we did the uh, Black-Scholes formula. Uh, so we have our formula for the discount factor, the two-period bond, for example. We'll just solve that forward. What does solve that forward mean? It means express that two-period discount factor as here's the first discount factor there, mt plus 1. Here is mt plus 2. And solving it forward means I express the xt plus 1 in terms of xt and epsilon t plus 1. So now I've expressed the two-period discount factor in terms of the initial state variable and the future shocks, epsilon t plus 1 and epsilon t plus 2. From here, it's just taking an expectation of a log normal. This stuff comes through unchanged. The epsilons all contrib contribute half sigma squared terms. You have a little mountain of algebra ahead of you. It works. It works by computer, certainly, but it's not that much fun. A cleverer way to do it is let's derive a difference or differential equation for price as a function of state variables. This is the way that we end up solving more complicated term structure problems. So what we'll do here is we'll guess that the pricing, the pricing in the end, the price is a linear function of the state variable. And we'll try to find the an and bn that make that work. And the way it's going to work out is we're going to be able to find a difference equation. From a n minus 1, we'll be able to figure out what a n is and same for b n. So given this guess, we'll use pricing logic to get from the price of the n minus 1 period bond to the n period bond. And that way, we'll be able to run through and get all the bond prices. What does pricing logic mean? Pricing logic says that the price of the n period bond is the expected discounted price of the n minus 1 period bond. So if you knew the a n minus 1 and b n minus 1, then you could work back and find the a n and the b n. That's the idea. OK, let's do it. Uh, the price of the n period bond is, by assumption, a n minus b n x t minus delta. The price of the n minus 1 period bond next period is a n minus 1 minus b n minus 1 xt plus 1 minus delta. We're going to substitute there for what today's xt plus 1 in terms of today's x. And we have our friend the discount factor right there. OK, now we take this e to expected value of e to all that stuff. We get the stuff and the half sigma squared terms. So the result of all that with just a little bit of algebra is this expression here, which is what? A constant a term in xt minus delta, and a term multiplying the variance of the, uh, of the error term. Now let's look at what we got. This is what, what the pricing relation says. It says, how do you get from the n minus 1s to the n's? It's one equation, but there are separately a constant term and a term multiplying xt minus delta. And those have to separately be equal. This has to hold for every x. So the, the constant terms have to be equal to each other. And the terms multiplying xt minus delta have to be equal to each other. So the green terms say that bn has to equal 1 plus phi times bn minus 1. Aha! That's a difference equation for the bn's. I know B0, b0 has to be 0. The price of a maturing bond is 1. So then we just work that through. b0 is 0, b1 is 1, b2 is 1 plus phi, b3 is 1 plus phi plus phi squared. What am I doing? This is a difference equation. I am solving a difference equation from the initial condition b0 equals 0, or I'm finding the formula for the bn's. The a's work the same way. The constant terms, I've got an equals that plus that. Uh, once I'm given the bn's, then I have a difference equation for the an's, which you can work out in the same way. Takes a little more time to do it, but you get you can see all these risk premium terms appearing in the AN formulas. So plug those back in, and we get once again the same uh, formulas for the uh, uh, for the uh, discrete time Vazicek model. Here's another way to do it: the risk neutral approach. This is very clever and can be dangerous in the wrong hands. You have to be careful about what you're doing with the risk neutral approach. Let's look at the final answer. So here's my forward rate. Here was, and I, I rewrote it a little bit. I brought out the y1 
and condense the delta term in there. Um, so before I had delta plus phi times y1 minus delta, now I put the deltas here and the y1 there. And notice this is just an algebra trick at the moment. Notice what we can do. We, can, we have a phi n minus 1 there and a phi n minus 1 there. Let's condense those two terms in here. And so we have this term here plus those terms. But now look at what we've got. If we just called this thing delta star, we would have exactly the same formula, but with a, a, different, a different mean delta and no risk premium. So the cross-sectional model here is the same as a model with no risk premium, lambda equals zero, a risk neutral model, but a distorted mean, a mean delta star, which is delta minus, we fold the, the risk premium into the mean. Uh, now, if you, if, you, if, you do, if you put that delta star in and lambda equals zero, the algebra is quicker. I just went through the algebra here for the two period bond. Uh, it makes the algebra easier to, co to fold those things into delta star because then you don't have any market prices of risk left in, in your models. Uh, so the, the concept here is find a, a different distorted time series process than price as if risk neutral and you end up getting the same result. It's a nice trick for making the algebra easier, uh, but a little bit dangerous because this is not the true mean of the, uh, of the uh, one, one year rate. Thank you.